Okay, in this final lesson, final lesson of the year, by the way, we're going to talk about the end of Reconstruction. Okay, uh, remember after uh, Andrew, jo uh, Andrew Johnson is impeached, you know, he's going to, you know, serve out the rest of his time, and then Ulysses S. Grant is going to be elected in 1868, and he is going to serve his for four term. You know, African Americans voted in great numbers. You know, they look at this man as a guy who helped liberate him, and they vote in large numbers, and Grant is easily elected to his first term. But his, um, his uh, you know, uh, administration is plagued with corruption. There's many people in his cabinet that are accused of, uh, of taking bribes and doing some things that just, you know, are a little unsavory. There's no proof that actually Grant was involved at all, but, you know, he's still ultimately responsible. So, uh, you know, he's going to have a kind of a tough presidency. You know, part of the problem is that, you know, Grant had, had um, you know, selected many of his friends, many of his former colleagues, and, you know, they're accused of stealing lots of money, and, of course, this looks badly on Grant. Now, Grant does win re-election, you know, po possibly because of his enormous popularity from the Civil War, but his, you know, his administration is not going to be, uh, you know, thought of as a really good one. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, because of this corruption, that's uh, associated with the president and the Republicans. The Republicans begin to lose power. Now, here's a couple pictures I'm going to show you. Here's a picture of President Grant with his family right here. Uh, he has a large family. Um, but when he leaves office, he is plagued with financial troubles. Um, he doesn't have a lot of money. He decides that he is going to start writing a memoir. By the way, he's becoming very, very ill. He has cancer, probably from all those cigars he smoked, right? And he was able to finish this, and you can see him here. You can see the man is very ill. He's wrapped up in a blanket. He's got a little stocking cap on, finishing his memoirs. And this is the, the book when it is completed right here called The Civil War Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, which sells quite a few copies and was able to secure at least a financial uh, independence for his family. But he's going to die shortly after he finishes this novel, right after he leaves, leaves office. Okay, But, again, he is a Republican. And because of the corruption with the Grant administration and for the fact that, uh, you know, the people in the North begin to lose interest, you can see the, the Republicans begin to decline and Reconstruction in the South come kind of to an end. Okay, like I mentioned, by 1870, the Radical Republicans are beginning to lose power. Um, you know, a lot of corruption, a lot of people are just, you know, just tired of it. And like... This says, you know, the Northerners are tired of trying to reform the South. You know, they're, they're bashing their head against the wall. Uh, the South is, is trying to keep the South as unchanged as possible. And again, like I said, corruption had turned people against the Republican Party. So, 1872, Congress passes the Amnesty Act. And what this does, it restores rights to vote to nearly all white people in the South. Remember, after the Civil War... Many people who had been former Confederates or Confederate leaders. You know, the Radical Republicans had blocked them from voting. Well, by 1872, you know, seven years later, they're saying, yeah, all right, we're just going to let them all vote. And the people in the South are overwhelmingly Democratic, right, Southern Democrats. And these people are going to keep many of the African Americans from voting. So... Now we're up to the election of 1876. Grant is leaving office. All right? Again, we're going to have another disputed election. Oh, my gosh, we've talked about several of those, right? Dispute in the Electoral College. Um, so they have to have a special commission to settle the, um, su settle the election results. Okay. So... The uh, Democrats, you know, they're going to put up a guy named Tilden, he, Samuel Tilden. He is from New York, um, and the Republicans choose the governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes, okay? And, you know, both of these candidates are campaigning um, that they are going to stop corruption. They're going to stop corruption. Well, on the day of the election, Tilden wins the popular vote. More people vote for Tilden than Rutherford B. Hayes. But Tilden only has 184 electoral votes, one short, one short of what he needs, all right? So the outcome is going to come down to uh, 20 disputed votes. There's 20 disputed votes, okay? All but one came from the southern states. 
that are still controlled by the Republicans. Okay, now remember the inauguration is in March. It's not in January. But uh, they still have nobody who's, who won. Remember the elections in November, they're approaching March. They still haven't decided. Is it going to be Tilden? Is it going to be uh, Rutherford B. Hayes? Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? All right. So Congress, again, sets up that special commission, you know, to try to settle the crisis. Remember, um, if it's not settled in the um, Electoral College, it goes to the House of Representatives. All right. Now, this commission is made up of mostly Republicans. All right. And they decided to give all the disputed votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. Now, Southerners are upset. They actually could have probably challenged this because it looks a little fishy, but here's the deal. Um, although, you know, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes is a Republican, oh, shoot, as a Republican, he had privately agreed to end Reconstruction once he gets in the office. So he basically makes a deal with the South saying, hey, elect me, don't fight this, and I promise I'm going to end Reconstruction. Okay, here's that uh, map of the election of 1876. Of course, uh, uh, oh, you can look at how the map has changed again. All right, now we have the Montana Territory. We have the Wyoming Territory. Nevada is the proper shape now. Arizona Territory has been added. Washington Territory. So now you'll notice that all of the territories which are going to become future states all look correct. Well, except for uh, Dakota, all right? They still have just called that the Dakota Territory. They're eventually going to divide that into half, and they're going to have a North Dakota and a South Dakota. Oops, that's probably not right. All right. Anyways, okay, so the election of 1876, uh, Hayes wins most of the North, Tilden wins the South. The disputed states, and there's three, is going to be South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. And that's where they're going to cook that deal again uh, for Hayes is. All right, so if you look at the popular vote, Tilden wins the popular vote. 51 to 48. Um, and then after the election or the deal that uh, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes makes, you know, he is going to win 50.1 to 49.9. Wow, is that close, right? I bet you Tilden was very upset. But anyways, the new president is Rutherford B. Hayes. Okay, without fear of radical Reconstructionists and those radical Republicans sticking their nose in the Southern business, as the South would say, you see that the South begins to tighten their control and they start to restrict the rights of African Americans in the South. Okay, and one of the most important things they try to do is to stop them from voting. Right, so they put on poll taxes. Poll taxes are taxes that required voters to pay a fee. You know, pay money to vote. Now, many of these freedmen are poor; they don't have the money to vote. So they could rarely afford to vote. That is completely unfair. Having to pay a tax to vote. All right? But the worst, it was called the literacy test. Required voters to read and explain parts of the Constitution. And remember, um, up until the Civil War, it was illegal to teach a slave to read or write. Right? So most freemen had very little education. And basically this test is to make sure that they can't vote. But there are many white people in the South that also cannot read or write, right? So what do we want? You know, people in the South want the white people to vote. But uh, what are we going to do about this? Well, they pass a grandfather clause. Oh, my gosh. And this is really baloney. And this law states that a voter's father or grandfather could vote on January the 1st, 1867. Then that voter did not have to take the literacy test. Now, let me ask you a question. Did any African-American father or grandfather have the right to vote on January 1st, 1867? Because remember, the 15th Amendment hasn't been passed yet. The answer is no. That means every African-American has to take the literacy test. Now, let's go the other way. How about white people? Did their father or grandfather have the right to vote? Yes, they did. That means that no white person has to take the literacy test. This is completely and obviously a plot just to keep African Americans from voting. Okay, so the South then, you know, they handle the voting situation, so then they're going to start passing laws to make sure that there's segre segregation. And segregation is the, oh shoot, this got kind of messed up, is the legal separation of races. 
Okay, we're going to make sure that the African Americans and the white people are going to be separated. All right. So in southern states, Jim Crow laws are passed that separate blacks and whites. There's going to be black schools and there's going to be white schools. There's going to be black restaurants and there's going to be white restaurants. In the theaters, uh, white people all get to sit, you know, uh, in the front, and African Americans have to sit in the back or in the balcony. All right. Uh, on trains, there's going to be separate cars for African Americans. And, um, uh, and same with streetcars. Streetcars, the only African Americans can ride in the back or in separate cars. There's going to be separate playgrounds, separate hospitals, and even separate cemeteries. Oh, my gosh. Are you so bigoted that you can't even be buried next to an African American? This is unbelievable. Now, let's get back to the schools for just a second. All right. So if you have black schools and you have white schools, right, and they're separated legally, do you think they're going to be equal? You know, same quality books, same quality materials, same quality buildings, same quality teachers? The answer is going to be no. Absolutely not. African Americans are going to have very little uh, textbooks. Their furniture, their desks are going to be terrible or missing altogether. Teachers are going to be poor quality. This is a this is a, this is illegal, or, or, or I think it should be illegal. And so they actually appeal. So in a case of Plessy versus Ferguson, okay, it's a Supreme Court case, and the Supreme Court rules that separation was legal so long as the facilities for black and whites were equal. But guess what? They rarely were. They rarely were. Uh, the African Americans are going to get the worst stuff. They're going to get the poorest education, the poorest teachers, the poorest quality materials. Right. So again, Supreme Court has kind of in a way, turned their back on the African Americans in the South. Now, even though African Americans are getting the short end of the deal on this, you know, you have to remember, though, that the 14th Amendment did grant them citizenship. It did. 15th Amendment did give them the right to vote. So even though it's going to take almost 100 years before all these things really uh, blossom into what they are intended, at least the stage was set by the 14th and 15th Amendment granting citizenship and the right to vote. Okay, some other examples of some of these Jim Crow laws. You know, freedmen were forced, forced to choose an employer and sign a binding contract, which is baloney, a binding contract. If these uh, people break the contract or, you know, they can be thrown into prison, they can be forced onto a plantation uh, working for nothing as a prisoner. We kind of talked about that in the last lesson, all right? Look at this, black children... Children of the freedmen could be indentured, dentured servants until the age of 21, which means that they can be um, forced to work for nothing, you know, almost, like slaves, until the age of 21. Blacks were forbidden by law to insult whites. And what does that mean? I mean, any way, you know, a person goes, I don't like the way he looked. I don't like the way he looked at me. I don't like his tone of his voice. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine that? Blacks were uh, forbidden to marry whites. It was illegal for a, uh, a black person, a white person to marry. They were not allowed to challenge the word of whites in court. Oh, my gosh. Uh, this is incredible. This sounds so much like the, um, the slave code, doesn't it? Right? Insulting whites, uh, indentured servitude, uh, challenge the word of whites in court, hold office, uh, this is exactly like it was before the end of the Civil War. And don't you think that many people in the North who had fought for the abolition of slavery and, uh, you know, to bring equality are going to be disgusted with what's going on in the South? I mean, it, it is it's a very, very sad situation. And again, this is going to last for decades, decades, that these laws are going to be in place. Okay. So let's talk about the economy. Remember, after the Civil War, the economy has been devastated. Um, but you, you have to remember, and I talked about this a long, long time ago, I think in Chapter 14, that the South has a lot of natural resources, and they're just not capitalizing on it. They're only interested in growing cotton. Well, of course, in the South, you know, during the C Civil War and shortly thereafter, uh, cotton obviously takes a back seat. But after the Civil War, you start to see that cotton begins to resume. And by 1880, the South is growing as much cotton 
as it did in 1860. So the cotton um, industry is back, back to where it was in 1860, all right? But the South has learned that it's not going to use or just, you know, it's going to use more of its natural resource. It begins to build textile mills. Why are we shipping up all this cotton to the north for them to turn it into cloth? Now we can grow the cotton, we can build our own textile mills, and we can sell the cloth, all right? So they start to build these textile mills to turn cotton into cloth. They have new machinery, especially in the tobacco industry. They have new machinery to take that um, harvested tobacco. And by the way, the, the South controls 90% of the tobacco industry, and they start selling tobacco instead of shipping that to some other uh, manufacturer. They also start to look at their natural resources. You know, the, uh, in the South, there's lots of iron and coal, especially in Alabama. So you start to see steel mills pop up in in Alabama. You know, there's a, it used to be where the steel industry is really uh, large in Pennsylvania, in Ohio. You start to see some new industry, especially steel mills in Alabama. And then, of course, they're going to find oil. Oil, oh my gosh, in Louisiana and in Texas. And even today, uh, these states have made a tremendous amount of money off of oil. Other states, you start to see copper, granite, and marble. The South is finally starting to take uh, advantage of their natural resources. All right? So there you have it. Um, reconstruction is over. It ends. You know, Rutherford B. Hayes is the new president. He's made a deal to make sure that the, uh, uh, they get out of the business of try to, trying to reconstruct the South. You start to see where the South begins to take advantage of that opportunity and uh, take away the voting rights and restrict the rights and freedoms of African Americans living in the South. And finally, you start to see some new industry in the South. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're going to leave you. Uh, we have covered everything from the age of exploration all the way to the end of Reconstruction in America. It's been a pleasure.